All right, there we go. We are live. This is session 47 uh, of Mask of Nahar the Othotep. Um, you guys are in Australia, or currently off the coast of Australia, uh, on your way to uh, the, the port city of Darwin to look into Randolph shipping. Uh, last time, you guys did get a significant amount of information from, uh, from the McGuire Diary and Professor Dodge. Uh, including coordinates uh, for what was uh, what's purported to be a lost city in the middle of the Great Sandy Desert. Um, coordinates that line up with the um, the pinpoint you saw on the map on the map in the Bent Pyramid. Uh, that is a place of great importance to uh, Nahaliothotep, probably. The, uh, the location of a gate that you would very much like to deal with. Uh, so far, you guys have uh, done fairly well. Uh, Evelyn may or may not have made a deal with some unknown entity for magical power. Uh, <laughs> and uh, when last we left, uh, Eugene had a uh, psychotic break while reading one of the manuscripts you've picked up. Uh, and tried to murder Evelyn, and then when Gary and Miles intervened, he uh, tried to murder Gary and pretty came pretty close to uh, to succeeding. Uh, so as we as we pick up, uh, Eugene has just come to his senses. Uh, Gary is laying on the uh, on the floor in uh, the room, blood pooling by his head where he got slammed off the bulkhead. Um, you guys are still, at this point, you're probably about five days out from Darwin. You guys have been on the steamer for about a week. Uh, so you've just got about... Just enough to get into trouble. Just enough to get into trouble. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you've got about five days until you reach port. Uh, but we'll turn it over to you guys to uh, figure out what you would like to do. Has he been... I Put in the brig yet, or or were we just standing over the corpse of? Oh no, I, 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 <laughs> it's not a corpse we, yet. We left, we left the game and I broke into a, a panic, dropped on my knees. Um, Evelyn cast a spell on me that didn't work. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad about last. that. And just and, like uh, the in the general discord. Yeah, and they're and they're... I'm gonna. Uh, sorry. 
Sorry. Uh, there is no brig on board the ship. Um, I mean, there's people that kind of handle if a, if a passenger gets rowdy or something like that, and usually they're like locked in their stateroom until uh, until you dock. And uh, I'm still panicking. Uh, I'm going to crawl to Gary and try to fix him. What have you done? Fuck, 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 fuck. And I'm just patching. I don't trust Eugene. I tried to uh, tackle him and subdue him again. All right. Uh, I am going to relance against that. I am not defending myself. Okay. Perfect. Uh, make a brawling roll, Miles. Um, you'll succeed, but this is that's how skills go up. So. Just just in case if you get like an extreme success and things start to curtail. Um, yeah, you manage to. It, it's not graceful by any stretch, but you do manage to uh, to kind of grab him and subdue him. Um, Eugene, as he's getting tackled on, was going to scream, "I saw her ending the world, but she knows the name of God. She, she, she. I was compelled to end to do something. She knows how to end the world. He's just raving." Now I want to punch him and knock him out. <laughs> You sound totally sane. <laughs> Just chuck me right under the bus. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh... I I have to rationalize this in a way or another, and I that's the feeling I got when he cast his call. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, so Eugene is ranting. Miles, you're like trying to knock him out. Uh, he's wiggling a fair bit. Uh, eventually. Um, uh, unless Eugene is deliberately trying to resist, eventually you'll be able to, like, basically subdue him and knock him unconscious. I'm not the one you should worry about. You should do something about Gary and lights out. Okay. Evelyn is going to, once Eugene is not near Miles, or once, sorry, Eugene is not near Gary, um, She'll edge her way over to Gary uh, and try to administer first aid. All right. Uh, make a first aid roll. It's 46, but here's hoping. Oh. Uh, I will spend the luck to pass. Uh, all right, so that'll give Gary back one hit point. Gary is in a bad way. He is going to need medical attention. So yeah, uh, I will be uh, cradling Gary, kind of trying to get the bleeding to stop, and uh, look over it. No, is Alvin there? I'm playing cards. Oh, he's, uh, <laughs> you were Alvin playing cards, that's right. You were yeah, aware of it. He's playing cards yeah, with yeah. his new lady friends from Pinoch. Yeah, and yeah his, uh spending time with the old folks. Uh, yeah, look to Miles then. He needs a doctor. Uh, I will attempt where to go. Is, I'll, I'll go see where is Alvin? I don't, I don't know. I haven't seen Alvin much since we got on board the ship. So, Chris, I don't know if it's public knowledge, if there is a ship's doctor, and if so, where that person can be located. Uh, give me, make a luck roll. No, serious. Okay. 
Uh, there is a doctor on board. Uh, unfortunately, he is. Um, he he's not in any condition currently to uh, to practice medicine. I mean, I've brushed up on my medicine a little bit, but certainly not enough to do anything significant. Evelyn will just continue holding Gary, looking kind of helpless for a change. Do we... Chris, with my medicine, can I at least tell if we've stabilized him? Uh, um, yeah, between you and Evelyn, um, you can't do you can't do much to to get him back on his feet, but you can make sure that he's not bleeding to death. Right. Though, actually, uh, both of you can make medicine rolls. Oh, I've only got four medicine. <laughs> That's okay. I mean, I've only I got can... five. <laughs> I thought for some reason I, put, I thought I put some points into it, but I guess not. Am I the am I the doctor that is not in any state to help in that case? I think I have the best medicine in the group. <laughs> All right. Um. So the two of you, the two of you, are confident that he's not in immediate danger of dying. Uh, but he's going to need medical care. He's lost a lot of blood. Go find Alvin. Um, do we know where we're all staying? Like, have we shared what cabin we were at? Um, I would imagine yes. I mean, most of you at this point are fairly paranoid. Um, I know that Gary's cabin was between Evelyn's and Eugene's. Because yeah. we mentioned Evelyn staggering past Gary's room blind. Yeah. yeah. All right. If I know where Alvin's cabin is, I'm going to go there first. And if it's not there, I'm going to start a. I'm going to start a mad dash for any area that's a primary gathering social place. Because he's like that, I think. All right. Yeah. I mean, in in fairly short order, you can you can find Alvin. He seems to be playing cards with some lovely ladies from like. I'll say they're from, like, London. I imagine... Miles, come, pull up a, come pull up a chair. I'll introduce you. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Sharp... Um, unfortunately, Mr. Sharp... Uh, duty calls and you are unfortunately being beckoned um the socializing well i would love to meet these fine ladies we'll have to wait for either later this evening or perhaps tomorrow night so alvin does that spock like his eyebrow goes up he's like duty calls oh my eyes yes. are like bugging absolutely. out yes <laughs> duty calls. yes absolutely i'm sorry ladies uh 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 any i just get up and walk away from the table What's going as on, I walk? ask, as I, as, as I ask him to lead on. For reasons I'm not clear on, because I wasn't in the room at the time, Eugene attacked Gary, and while Gary is stable and not going to die at the present moment, he requires urgent medical attention. I don't believe the ship's doctor is readily available. So, Eugene, number one, Eugene needs medical attention beyond the first aid that Evelyn has given. And Eugene needs to be kept cuffed, subdued until whatever has happened to him passes, after which I'm not sure if he's going to face uh, charges because I don't know if there's any police on board this ship or security. Okay, after Miles is done and Alvin realizes he's not joking, um... Alvin's going to say, okay, you hold him, I'll go find the captain. Well, currently, Eugene is knocked unconscious and subdued. Gary is being 
comforted as best as possible by Evelyn. Okay, let's go get to the captain. All right, let's go look for the captain. Chris, my idea here is if we have someone who is dying, um, we need the doctor, whatever state he's in, and or we need to change the destination of the boat. Okay. All right. uh, yeah, you can find the captain. It's uh, well, actually, we never did determine what time of day it was. Bloody o'clock. Yeah, we'll say it's like seven o'clock in the evening. Um, so yeah, you can find the the captain. The captain is basically um, kind of in the dining hall, kind of making the rounds with the with the people, that sort of thing. It's uh, it's not difficult to kind of grab his attention. Do we do we know his name? One sec here. Captain, Captain, I must speak to you urgently. Uh, there's been some, there's been some kind of an accident before he like, before he asks what's going on. Like, there's been some kind of an accident. There's a man who is in, who might might be bleeding to death. Where is the doctor? Uh, just, a, just a second. His name is uh, Captain Branson. And James Branson. Sounds like a good captain y name. So, uh, yes, and he kind of like makes his excuses to uh, to the people that he's uh, with. You do see like some shocked look on the faces um, since this wasn't exactly like a whisper in his ear sort of thing. Uh, and he's it most certainly was not. He yeah. was to grab his attention and put him on the spot of having to do something. Yeah. So, you know, there's like some shock look on the faces of the passengers and stuff like that. He's kind of like, kind of like, oh, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. And then he follows you uh, to go get the doctor. If he asked what happens, I wasn't there, but, and neither was my companion Miles here, but there's blood everywhere. There's this man who's clinging to, to, to dear life. Okay. Um, follow me. You know, like lead you uh, kind of to like the cruise quarter section, you know, it's like, you know, starts banging on the door. It's like, Bradley, open up. There's been an emergency. Like knocking, knocking hard. I'm going to give him another 20 seconds before I kick that door down. Okay. Uh, there's some, some noise from inside. It's like the voice from this. I was like, what? An emergency? There's a man dying. Get out here. All right. A couple more minutes pass. You can hear like fumbling around. It's like, just be a second. I'm, my I'm shoes. not willing to wait minutes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's just, it takes him some time to get dressed. But does he come to the door or he do did. I just hear fumbling on the other side? No, he came to the door and found out what's going on and then said he would be ah. a second. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, I thought he was talking through the door. My apologies. No. Um, and when he makes his way out, I mean, he looks he looks like somebody who just, like, literally just rolled out of bed. Uh, quite possibly still uh, a little bit hungover. I mean, given the fact that it's 7 o'clock in the evening and he was asleep and hungover. Yeah. He is still a better doctor drunk than I am a doctor sober. Uh, so lead, the, lead the way. Miles? I will lead them to the cabin in question. Okay. Uh, and the As he's leading the doctor there, I'm going to pull the captain a little bit behind, uh, behind them and they say, I think someone attacked him. Mm. What do you have to be able to hold someone in case I'm right? Um, we can secure him in one of the state's rooms. Okay, I'm just giving the the captain the 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 heads up that this might be a situation we're walking into as well, right? So, yep. All right. 
Uh, and as they walk, the doctor will ask Miles, you know, kind of like basic questions to kind of get a sense as to what happened. Where exactly was, like, Eugene's bleeding from where? Like, he got stabbed, uh, right? Uh, no, Gary. Gary, sorry. Uh, no, Gary, basically, Eugene lunged at him barehanded and kind of slammed him back against the, the bulkhead. So it's no weapon wound, it's just like a hard slam against the bulkhead. Okay. Um, I will explain that um, I believe my part, I believe my friend, well, I wasn't there at the time, but from what it what sounded like is he, he got dizzy, he disoriented, and I don't know if lost his balance. I don't know if the ship suddenly lurched a little bit, but he fell in such a way that... Um, his body made contact with the bulkhead or something, and in the battle of steel versus flesh, steel won. Mm, it's not the first time I've seen such a thing happen. Oh, he kind of like leans heavily against the wall, kind of catches it, like takes a breath. It's like, okay, okay, carry on. And uh, we will rush over. Rush and before long, you guys make your way back to where Evelyn is. Chris, we're not aware he was stabbed, right? Because neither Miles or no. Uh, he wasn't stabbed. Ah, okay, good. He's just tackled into the bulkhead, right? Right. Okay. <clears throat> um. So yeah. So Evelyn. Um. Miles and. Uh, uh, and Alvin uh, show up. The, the captain is here. Uh, this is very disheveled looking person carrying like a doctor's bag. Kind of like, kind of like uh, motions for you to, to move out of the way. Um, he does smell like day old bourbon, uh, but his hand seems steady enough. Uh, like basically like once he's focused on work, Act like reflex kind of takes over sort of deal. And he starts uh, double checking over Gary. Evelyn will back out of the way, wringing her hands a bit, and then realizing that they're covered in blood. Chris, this is Alvin's first view of the... Um... Um, what's the crime scene? We call it the crime scene. Um, yeah. It, looking around, what's my expert assessment of what the hell happened here? Uh, it looks like there was a fight here. Uh, you know, some of the, the furniture and stuff is kicked over. Uh, Eugene is laying kind of like sprawled out on the, the floor. Uh, Gary is like closer to one of the, one of the bulkheads. There's a, a fairly large pool of blood that's, uh, it hasn't been long enough that it's starting to get tacky or anything. So it's still... Like, as the ship moves, it's still, like, the puddle of blood is, like, oozing this Pretty way and liquid. that way. It's still very liquidy. And uh, the doctor starts getting into work on, uh, on Gary. Chris, I'm a fairly smart and on the tip of my toes kind of person. Is there anything I can do quickly to make this seem more like what Miles said and less like there was a complete battle in here. Um, like, is there a chair I can pick up surreptitiously or a table I can write or something that I can do to make it less look like less of a fight? I mean, not, I know that not all, everyone is a detective like him and he has an eye for this, but there's got to uh, be something I can do. Um, yeah, you can, you can like straighten around some of the furniture and stuff i mean obviously the folks that are here are going to know that you change things around but anybody else that comes around wouldn't notice more importantly everyone's looking at the guy who's dying yeah bleeding to death so i think i can i, I don't know if it's a stealth to kind of like try to stealthily or surreptitiously pick some up they might know that i moved yeah. stuff the goal they might not necessarily catch on to the goal um yeah why don't we call that a stealth rule Oh, look at that. Yeah, everybody Everybody seems to be focused on Gary. I write some tables, move some chairs. 
Yeah. I mean, as it is, I mean, Miles' story isn't far off. I mean, Gary did fall and did connect with the bulkhead. It's just that he was shoved as opposed to losing his balance. So his story is not far off. <laughs> just the chase down the hallways and stuff like that. They're different, right? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the the doctor gets to work on Gary. Um, it'll, it will take him a while, but he's working on it. But he does let you know that um, it seems like the it seems like the wound is largely superficial. It's just that head wounds bleed a lot. Um, so your friend uh, doesn't appear to be any, in any immediate danger. Will he survive the rest of the journey? Uh, I don't, well, we'll put him in a bed and we'll keep an eye on him, make sure he gets plenty of fluids and stuff. Um, I can tend to him here and then transfer him to the hospital once we reach Darwin. Chris, what's my level of certainty with this dude who smells like Dale Bourbon? Uh, he does seem to be very focused now that he actually has a thing to do that's sort of like clarity in the moment from adrenaline i nod to him and uh i need a word with uh with evelyn i'm wondering if the captain is going to actually let me have that or is he going to start asking questions and stuff uh the captain seems like he's you know he's willing to let the doctor do his job and if you need him then he'll do whatever is needed but other than that, he's like, not my circus, not my monkeys. Fair. I want to I wanna huddle with Miles and uh, with Evelyn. Yeah, and you can just can't even move to like, you know, the, the like adjacent room sort of thing. I keep one yeah. eye yeah. on uh, Eugene. Okay. Yeah. Um, I tell Evelyn, so how did he fall? I said he lost his I said he lost his balance, the ship lurched a bit, and he met the bulkhead in the battle of steel versus flesh, steel won. Right, Evelyn? What? <clears throat> How did he fall? I simply said he lost his balance from what I ascertained because I said I was not in the room. Because I wasn't. I, 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 I get that, Miles. Mm hmm I need a little bit more, Evelyn. No one's listening. Eugene tackled him into the bulkhead. Were his eyes black? Her her eyes are wide. <laughs> I don't remember. I don't think I noticed. Okay, he's gonna get medical care. Mm -hmm. What do we do about the second unconscious person in that room. I can't speak for everyone, but I'm going to guess that at least most of us have unfortunately had an episode or two like this since we decided to get neck deep in it. In the end, we stick with each other. We're there for each other to give us the best support we can. If necessary, I have uh, that lovely therapist from Egypt with us to talk to him in generalities. Right. What um, I mean to say is, did he, say, come, did he to? come to? Was this a passing thing? Or is this... He was yelling something before Miles knocked him out. It sounded like incoherent rambling to me, but this isn't my area of expertise. Because I'm not a doctor, but I feel like so far there are there is recoverable 
madness because of what we have to deal with and irrecoverable madness about things we have to deal with? I th That's my question. I think he'll be fine when he wakes up, but I I can't tell for certain until he wakes up and I have a chance to talk to him. There's not much I can tell from a, an unconscious body. And, and she'll look back captain. toward Gary. And in case the captain asks, why is there a second unconscious person in that room? I looked at Miles. I'm sorry? Well, one of them is bleeding to death, the other one's unconscious, right? So one of them fell and the other one... Oh, I didn't even address that thought. I was worried about explaining Eugene's injury. Sorry, uh, Gary's injury. I mean, I know how it happened. It was rather unfortunate that uh, I think he passed out dr from his drunken ramblings and uh, his terrible, deplorable behavior under the influence. Okay, that's fair. Um, maybe he or he slipped on the blood because he's not doesn't have sea legs and he hit his head too. That's good an excuse. I mean, of... I mean, he's a giant contusion on his face from you, right? Yes. And that's only if we're asked. Only if we're asked. Perfect. But we can take care of him and we can put him in a bed ourselves because he doesn't need medical attention. He's just a little passed out. And then we can watch him and see what happens when he wakes up. Is there anything else we need to know, Evelyn? He's not going to wake up and summon a dragon or something like that. No. Okay, then. Not to my knowledge. I can't tell what'll happen when he wakes up without talking to him. Okay, let's put him, Miles, where do you think is the best place to put him so until he wakes up? Just on the bed. Oh, what was that? Did you ask me something? Yeah, let's get him out of that room. Where the blood yeah, is, I'm let's put him. Let's get him to lie down somewhere, and then we can watch over him. Let's secure him in his cabin. Okay, let's put him in his cabin. Chris, that's where this all started, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, we are in his cabin. It's going to be exciting when we go to his cabin and see books everywhere. But okay, <laughs> Alvin, uh, Alvin, uh, Miles, give me a hand. Let's get him. Let's get him lined up. Aren't we in? Eugene's cabin. Uh, which no, cabin? A bit aside. Which cabin were you uh, t teaching Eugene in? Yours or his? His. Uh, then yes. So, so Gary is in Eugene's cabin. Because I had gone to Eugene's cabin because I couldn't see. I just stayed. <laughs> okay, so we have to get him in another cabin. Mine's two rooms down. Gary's between us. Yeah, let's get him in Gary's cabin. Gary's going to the infirmary, I guess. Uh, yes. Do they oh, okay. I, was say, I don't know if there is an infirmary. There is an infirmary. It might not be a sick bay, but there's an infirmary with a cot, right? And some bandages. Exactly. It's not like a surgical suite. Okay, so we get, if no one notices or everyone's too busy, we move um, We move Eugene to Gary's cabin. Yeah, uh, and when you guys come back to the, the room, the uh, the doctor and the, the captain, are basically the doctor's telling the captain what he needs in order to move Gary to the infirmary sort of thing. They're making all the necessary arrangements.
Chris, no one's paying attention to this room for now. Doesn't um, doesn't seem to be. What kind of um, paraphernalia is lying around just to make sure that no one accidentally walks away with a Necronomicon or something? The book of Dizan is out. The book of the book of Dizan is like out and open on the table. Well, it probably actually would have been knocked onto the floor during the scuffle. More than likely, yeah. So yeah, so there is a, the, there is a book. The rest is and There's a, a book bound in goatskin that has a distinct smell of sulfur on the floor. This is fantastic. Okay, so let's tidy up a bit. Um, you know, to make room for the stretcher that they need to to move him. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna tell Evelyn. How about you collect some stuff here and move it out of the way so we can. Uh, help the people get the stretcher in and we can move them comfortably. Uh, and the captain will come up and says, is there anything? This, this other gentleman, uh, the doctor looked him over. He seems to be breathing fine. No, uh, no significant loss of blood. Is there anything that you need me to do? And he kind of, I don't looked, think so. He, he looks at you with like the, you know, slightly arched eyebrows sort of thing. Uh, I'll, I'll ask around, yeah. and I'll tell you if there's anything more that needs to get done. Very well. Uh, we will uh, we'll send message when your friend recovers uh, and is able to uh, able to see visitors. Thank you. Um, but yes, Alvin, you've been uh, you've been around the block. He he definitely gave you the look of like I'm not going to ask unless you tell me I need to ask. Yeah. I'm waiting for everyone to kind of move out of the way and yep. for the body to move before we get into the, the, the deep here. I just want to make sure that all the stuff that someone can accidentally use to summon, I don't know, a flaming goat or something is not in the way. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Evelyn will start uh, shakily putting books away. Um, although she's smearing blood onto things. Does she, does she take care not to smear any blood on the books? That's kind of where I was. She's, <laughs> she's trying not to smear the pages. She doesn't give two shits about the covers. Okay. Uh, why don't you give me a, let's call it a dexterity roll. Oh, that's, all my rules are bad. Oh, God. 25 sure. dex. Is this where Chris turns around and pulls out like the monster manual of like vampire books? <laughs> I am not spending the amount of luck that that would take because uh, 36 luck is a bit much. All right. Um, so yeah, so you do get some, some blood on the, the covers and spines and stuff of these books as you're putting them away. kind of adds to the ambiance of them. <laughs> that was almost anticlimactic and or funny. I googled vampire books and then a bunch of wad stuff came up. Oh, of course it did. <laughs> of course it did, but it just didn't occur to me that it would. <laughs> That's how I met all of you except Chris. <laughs> that is true. Yeah. yeah. Man, we're all right. So they move out of the way. They do. We are um, left with yep. a bloody room, bloody books, yep, and an unconscious, insane person in the next room. Yep. Can we get a mop to clean up? Uh, yes, you can definitely. You can definitely get Perfect. that. Alvin looks really busy cleaning up the room because he is waiting for things to be passively normal. And it's clear of what he's doing where he has a really big conversation with the rest of the group. He just doesn't want to have it around a pile of blood. Um, and yeah, by the time you guys get the, the room kind of straightened up and tidied up, unless you want to do something else, it's been probably a couple of hours since everything happened 
Uh, Eugene still unconscious? Uh, Eugene is starting to uh, is starting to stir uh, when you check in on him. So we're I'm gonna ask people to join me in Eugene's room, and uh, I'm gonna ask what the hell happened. How did he go crazy? Eugene and I were reading the Book of Dizan. I don't know if that's better or worse than you guys being attacked by a monster on the boat. Neither do I right now. Better. It's better. <clears throat> because this will just be temporary. And Eugene will be fine when he wakes up. And there's nothing coming after us again. Chris, I have a pair of handcuffs somewhere. Oh, undoubtedly. I'm going to handcuff him to the bed while he's unconscious. All right. And, and I look to everyone and I say, it's just for now. I don't know what he's going to be like when he wakes up. Does anyone give me a disapproving glance or anything like that? Or everyone's like, yep. Yeah. No disapproving glance here. <laughs> Evelyn's like giggity. <laughs> Not a room. That's my comment in the Discord chat. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> in Gary's room, not your room. <laughs> Right. Uh, and uh, Eugene, as you as you start to regain conscious, like your jaw is sore, your hands are sore. Um, you you got to kind of like rub your face and like your hand won't move. You're apparently like chained up. Uh, but you come to yourself. You are uh, you are yourself again. He's alone in the, in the room where he is. Oh, certainly not. <laughs> yeah, you kind of like when he, when, you, you when crack your eyes open, and the, the three of them are the three of them are in the room. Because when when Eugene uh, wakes up, he starts crying. I imagine when she hears Eugene, like that first kind of sound that comes from the bed, she jumps, flinches away. Eugene? Eugene. Yes, I'm there. I take a step closer and I'm, I try to look him in the eye. Are his eyes black? No blacker than normal. All right, that's as far as my diagnosis can go. <laughs> Does he seem to recognize me? I I lost it, man. Can you explain to us what happened? I, I was in the back seat. I didn't control anything, but I remember everything. Chris, that yeah. sounds a lot like what Evelyn explained to us that one time, right? Uh, yes, it does. But I felt everything. I had a deep... Professor Dungeon deep, Master deep, here. Deep. And he, 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 he gulped noisily. <laughs> felt it was primordial to kill. 
my life depended on it. Even if I was not there and had control to stop it. Right around. And what made you do this? Remember every fucking day. What? How did this happen so we can avoid it happening again? me over what took you over how is it going to do it again I don't think it's a something something is broken all the thing we saw it broke something in the mind I don't think it's an entity it's something it did to us to make darkness for fighting. Makes me weak. Felt I needed to protect us. Everything I needed to do this is to do it. Where I wouldn't be slaves of the darkness anymore. So you attacked him because you thought you were protecting us? Not us, us, but everything, the world. But I was not in the driver's seat. It felt like some other part of me that was, and I couldn't stop it. Because I know, I know, no one here is here to destroy the world. But it felt like it. it. Felt if I only could crack those bones, I could stop it. Oh. It doesn't make sense now, but it, it did at the time. Somehow. Somehow it felt like the only thing I could do. Okay, I need a cigarette. Calvin just like walks out to like a balcony somewhere overlooking the ocean, lights a cigarette. He needs to he needs to decompress here for a minute. A guy he thought he could trust thought that we were going to destroy the world and tried to kill another one, and he doesn't know why he did it. We need, we need to understand what we're fighting against. Every time we look deeper into it, the cracks become wider in our minds. I think I need someone to speak to. I don't want to hurt any one of you. But I remember the feeling of wanting to, and it's gnawing at me. It's the last thing I want. I remember the sound of Gary cracking. Uh, refined, terrible sound. Oh. 
we need we need to do this. We need to understand what we're fighting. I don't think there's no coming back home from this. At least not for me. I just want to confirm Evelyn and Miles, where are they in there with him? Uh, as far as I, I know. As far as I know. Yeah. Evelyn is. She's uh, kind of has her arms wrapped around herself, despite the fact that her hands are still bloody. And she's probably got like blood smeared on her shirt and her skirt. Okay, Alvin's going to come back after having, like, downed an entire yeah. pack in, like, pack in 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Eugene? Eugene? Yes. yes. If I was the one in chains, and you're over here trying to understand what had just happened, what would you do if you were in my place? Eugene rubs his eyes, get the tears out. I'd check specifically the knowledge that the last thing I'd remember before it went nuts. The last thing I remember is a sentence that Evelyn translated. Well, I remember the violence, I remember the crimsons. But the last thing before it took over was a sentence. About power, suffusing the bodies of those who practice, and that those who rise are the one who takes over the one from the others. That sentence translated to me was the tipping point. Don't know why it that I lost. I lost it when I heard it. Felt like danger that I needed to address right now. I'm going to ask you for more details about that. Can you say that again slowly? The explanation or what I would do in your situation? No, what broke you? Evelyn helped me translate the sentence. I couldn't only just he was Ted wouldn't read alone, so Evelyn was helping me. And the sentence said something about power being gained by the people who have it and it would be stored in their bone and their brains and their body. And those who grew to great power were the one who took took it from the other one. Felt like anybody who had such power had taken it and that it was gonna hurt others to take it. And I felt like I needed to act on it 
and then it switched off. I lost control. Something primal me took over. But I don't think it's a part of me. But I don't think it's like a ghost or an entity. It's just all the things we seen is made a splinter in me. Because I couldn't see what I was doing, but I couldn't stop it. It didn't make sense. It did at some time. I'm trying to say I need to see a shrine. So we need to get what we're fighting, but damn, it takes a toll. I was trying to get that book so I could cure someone of exactly this thing, man. I don't want to hurt anyone. Is Gary all right? Please tell me he's all right. They've taken him to the infirmary. At least he's still breathing. <laughs> that crunch is gonna haunt me on every night. Alvin's gonna look to uh, Evelyn and say, "You've gone through something like this." And he kind of like shakes his head at a loss, like, what do we do? We... I don't know. It will depend on how Gary is, I think. Overall, we need to, we need to continue. We need to see this through to the end. Eugene? Yes. I'm going to bring you a glass of whiskey. You're going to sleep in this bed tonight. Tomorrow morning. We'll talk, okay? Yeah. Alvin specifically puts the keys that he was holding back in his pocket and goes to go serve the poor man a glass of whiskey. Alrighty. He gives it to uh, Eugene. And uh, basically, he's going to let the guy sleep this one off. And then tomorrow morning, when I feel more comfortable with the decision I have to make, he'll unlock the, uh, the handcuff. All right. Does anyone react negatively to this decision that Alvin has done unilaterally? That he's only leaving Eugene with one cuff for a few minutes? Well, for, the, for, for, for tonight. He's going to sleep in the bed till tomorrow morning. So he's just going to be cuffed for the night. Evelyn does not look uncomfortable with that at all. So I'm sorry, you're going to cuff him for the night or not cuff him for the night? He is staying cuffed for the night. So he doesn't he stab doesn't us in our stab sleep. Us. Oh, no, that's fine. I'm totally fine. <laughs> okay. Good. <laughs> Luckily, he doesn't have to defend that position. Okay.
I need to wash. I need a larger glass of whiskey. Good night, Eugene. Good night. Alvin's going to leave Eugene with his own demons tonight. Okay. Yep. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> harsh, man. Harsh. Uh, Eugene, uh, Evelyn is going to do each of the uh, births have their own washer? Uh, and probably not. Okay. I need to wash up. And then I will come back. Do you guys remember the scene in Back to Future 3 where Doc no. gets broken up with and goes to the bar in the Midwest and then it ends up being like 6 in the morning or 8, 9 in the morning and he's still up telling crazy stories and people are laughing while he appears completely inebriated? Yep. Nope. Yeah, that's what Alvin's going to do. Except um, he's then... actually going to drink the alcohol. What uh, what what does the bed frame look like to which uh, Eugene is uh, fixed? Um, it's probably pretty sturdy. Like it's probably bolted to the like bolted to the wall sort of thing. Yeah, okay. hopefully you don't have to go to the bathroom tonight. Oh, uh, Eugene is seriously then like looking at how can I get my arms down? I don't want to go out of the bed, but that's going to be uncomfortable. And looking at solutions to try to get his his bed unhinged so he can just get his arm down. <laughs> um, if everything is pretty sturdy, he's just gonna drink this glass. Yeah, everything is pretty um, sturdy. I mean, you can get yourself into as comfortable a position as you can, but it's still not even remotely comfortable, and that arm is going to be asleep in the morning. Oh yeah. That's why before the arm doesn't work, he's looking at, yeah, can I just wrench it? <laughs> uh, but uh, come, uh, come morning, as long as nobody else is up to anything, uh, everybody does eventually get some, some semblance of sleep, whether it's, you know, artificially induced or, or not. Uh, Evelyn's going to go wash up, and then she will actually come back to Gary's room and curl up in a chair across the room. Gary's room in the infirmary, or Gary's room in which I am? Gary's room where you are. Okay. She doesn't think that Gary's going to be waking up tonight and she doesn't want to uh, be there if anything goes worse uh, Eugene is sitting in the bed so it, you, he sleeps a bit more comfortably but he, his arm won't be as sore <laughs> eventually sleep comes for you all Oh, no. You make it sound like it's stalking us. <laughs> it, it is. is. <laughs> Obviously. Uh, I'm going to take a page out of, of uh, Noel's book and try to get to, to the dreams that are more comfortable tonight. Um, yeah, sure. Give me a, let's call it a power roll. Power or dreaming? <laughs> uh, let's call it a power roll. Okay. My power dropped since then. Oh. Uh, so, yeah, so you do actually have uh, a, a pleasant, pleasant dreams, not tortured by your inner demons or outer demons, as the case may be. 
things do look familiar esque uh, enough for you to realize that you know having been there in person you can start to identify the dreamlands from the normal world and from normal dreams uh, and it does uh, it does help to alleviate the pain and discomfort uh, during the night. Right now, it seems like it's the only place I'm going to be free of my own mind. Yep. Are you ever free of your own mind? Anyway. On the dreamland thing, so have an effect. In the morning, Please. once Alvin does manage to get, get up, he's going to go over to, um, to Eugene take a quick look at him he's not jumping or trying to kill anyone then he will unlock unlock the uh, cuff and say breakfast and accompany wow. him to the breakfast table and today wow. is going to be a full day of what would you, eugene's going to do whatever he thinks he needs to do alvin will not be far away there will be no pinochle today all right eugene is rubbing his arm cannot feel anymore <laughs> okay breakfast then alvin doesn't look super jazzed about this like he's good, doing the best impression of he can of like a 40k commissar like if someone steps out of line like he's stepping in okay uh and the doctor will send a send a message to you at breakfast that uh your friend is your friend is com comfortable. Um, they they will they've made arrangements. They've sent a telegraph to uh, get him into a hospital once you arrive in Darwin. Um, he doesn't think that it it'll be that long until your friend is on the mend. Basically, just keeping you apprised is Gary's condition. Alvin. Yes. You think we could go see him? I'm glad you asked. I want to make sure he's okay. Remorse is one of the things that I'm looking for. We go visit Gary. Okay. Um, I mean... It's not like he's got broken bones or anything, so he's basically just like in bed. His eyes are closed. He is he's resting. Uh he's probably sedated to help with the pain. Um, you know, fairly fairly big, like, you know, nineteen twenties gauze bandages on his head. Um But other than that I know a bit about medicine. Does he look well cared for? Uh as well as can be done on board a 1920s era steam vessel. As far as not sawing off limbs. Well, it was a head wound, so I can't really saw that one off. Eh, part <laughs> of the head, maybe. <laughs> maybe other people need to get their heads sawed off. Actually, no, we're in the era of drill, we're, or maybe we're just past the era of drilling to let the evil spirits out, so we could do a drilling or something. Oh, no, no, now they're drilling it so the pressure goes out. It's not demons, pressure. That's right. I don't know. There might be actual demons in his head. Um, I don't know anymore. Uh, but yes, he, he does look like he's being taken care of. Uh, the doctor, doctor looks as haggard as he did uh, the previous night. Uh, you're going to guess he probably hasn't gotten a lot of sleep. Uh, but he does seem to be sober. That's an improvement. Uh, Eugene's going to take out a necklace with a little uh, silver pendant on it and hand it to Alvin. Could you give that to Karen? I might check him. You could just, give it to him yourself. It's just good luck. I felt you were afraid that we'd do something terrible if I got close to him. That's why I was ending it to you. So you had it to him. How about you give it to him? And if you're going to do something yeah. terrible, I'm still here. Uh, Eugene's going to approach tentatively and put the necklace around Karen's neck. All right. He probably, like, you know, mumbles a little bit sort of thing. He's not, like, comatose or anything of that nature. 
Alvin watches very closely. Make a spot hidden roll. And you see it, it, Eugene is, is doing it like carefully because he's not confident in himself. <laughs> All right. Uh, everything looks like the, it's on the up and up, Elvin. Evelyn has just been following them around, by the way. Okay. Uh, and what has uh, Miles been up to this morning? Uh, I'm going to assist with. Uh... Right, I'm going to is actually. First thing I want to do is assist with. Keeping up on what's going on with our group, make sure that you know Gary is being taken care of. Keeping an eye out on Eugene, um, and if I'm satisfied with that for now, I'm gonna. Is there a, like a library on board the boat? Um, there's like a very small library. It, it's it doesn't have a ton of books and mostly like uh, some periodicals and nonfiction that sort of thing. Okay, so nothing that would necessarily be of use for our endeavors. Uh, no. I mean, you do I mean, have the, a you do have a, a bunch of like mythos tomes that you could read. I mean, that tends to go well. <laughs> nothing could go wrong with that. There's even one in English. I'm not sure if I've oh, read the God. one in English. Or not. Uh, the Book of Dizan. I don't think you have. It's slightly bloody. It's slightly bloody. Okay. Only slightly. Hey, you know what? I'm going to go get a big pot of coffee. I'm going to lock myself in my room and barricade it, and I'm going to give it a read. I'm specifically looking for anything of usefulness <laughs> for Nyarthalo Hovatep or about the dream time. I'm more fixated on that right now. Mark, are you for real? Yeah, I just want to check. I, I, just, I just can't tell right now if you're being. Sad. I don't know. I, <laughs> hey, I don't know which book you guys read that made you all go cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. So, <laughs> okay, that's fair. Fair. I mean, okay, the Book of Dizan would have some blood on the cover. That's probably dry by no. now. Eh, big and, deal. And it does smell <laughs> distinctly of sulfur. Yeah, it does. To be fair, it smelled like that three weeks ago, too, so. For the love of Christ! <laughs> hey, how do you spell Dizan? Uh, D Z Y Z A N. <laughs> Just look it up in the chat that you've got going on where he rolled, you go crazy. <laughs> Um, you know what I'm picturing? I'm picturing this prim and proper guy who normally doesn't bother to read this shit, getting a big pot of coffee, sitting comfortably like a proper English gentleman, sipping his coffee, and like, yes, yeah, let's see what kind of in useful facts we could find in this in our endeavors or my endeavors. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, so the, the Book of Dizan, it's, uh, it's an account of uh, the high masters of a, a world called Shambhala. Uh, and describes like this kind of generational transformation of consciousness that started on the planet Venus and ended on Earth. Uh, and apparently these uh, these enlightened beings of fire and flame um, kind of elevated humanity back when Hyperborea and Atlantis were young. Uh, and then it delves into a secret history of what, what was once the world, indicating that there were highly advanced civilizations that predated uh, the emergence of uh, humanity and of, you know, really of life on Earth. Um, it starts, you start to kind of like lose track when they start talking about like these civilizations that rose and fell and waged war against these incredible wind demons like millions of years ago. Um, but it will take you basically the rest of the journey to kind of digest it. Sounds like we have time. So it's about, it's a book about transcendence and civilizations from millions of years ago. Yes. It's a real page turner. 
It sounds enlightening. Uh, well, it did uh, raise your Cthulhu Mythos by three. Oh, sweet. Was there anything in there even vaguely about the dream time? Uh, only, like, tangentially at best. Uh, like, there's a lot of references to, like, he heightened states of consciousness and uh, an extra-dimensional existence. Nothing specifically about the dreamlands. Okay, cool. Do I have to do a sanity check or anything? Uh, no, I did that for you. You only lost four points, which is not enough to trigger an insanity. Ha! You need five. That's what I got. <laughs> you need five. Five is the magic number. Magic number, yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, Does he learn any spells? Uh, there are references to uh, two spells to contact uh, beings of a... Uh, Actually, what spells are in this book? I should check. It's the Dimensional Assembler one. That's the one I was reading because I wanted to go back to the the dream land. Uh, <laughs> yes, there there is a there is a information about being able to uh, contact and bind to your will beings capable of crossing dimensional barriers. Um, there is a spell to uh, contact the Herald of Azathoth. Uh, and there is a spell to summon creatures that are capable of transposing a human from Earth to the planets. Yeah, I don't want to go in space, Bill. That sounds terrible. Yeah, there is there is no spell about helping you to survive travel to other planets. Oh, I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so over the remaining like five days of your journey, is anybody doing anything in particular or just kind of keeping an eye on Eugene, keeping an eye on Gary? I uh, keeping an eye since, on uh, since Alvin is following me around, I'm going to check on him to see what he want to do because right now I'm trying to get back on track and if he's feeling stuck with me, I'm at least gonna make it interesting for him. Wanna go play card or have a drink? Alvin has no intention of having any fun. He is basically watching him say, Do what you do. I'm you get the distinct feeling that Alvin is evaluating you today. It's like parole officer Alvin. <laughs> Uh, is there anything Evelyn is up to? Um, for the morning, uh, Evelyn is just sort of trailing along with Alvin and Eugene. Uh, she's very quiet. Um, after we visit Gary... Uh, she's going to excuse herself and say that she needs to get some rest because she didn't sleep very well. And she's just going to go back to her room, lock the door, and go to sleep. Uh, so that is that basically what everybody's doing over the next like four or five days of your journey? Yeah, I'm going to give him two or three days before I lessen up, I lighten up a little bit. Um, I just want to make sure he feels sufficiently contrite and that whatever it is was a passing thing. All right. Well, first day, Eugene is like trying to be less of an inconvenience. And the day after that, you feel like, okay, he just want me to go with the motion. So he's just doing his normal thing. Reading. Uh, not terrible book, but still reading and doing his things and checking on Gary uh, Hoffman. Okay. Even if you feel he's going to get screamed at when he does, like the day he's coming in and then um, Gary's awake, feel it's going to be a terrible day for him, but uh, still doing his things. 
Alvin spends the day or week or however long we're going to spend musing about the old idiom that ignorance is bliss and how books are bad. Right. What a terrible what? lesson. Should I, should, I, should, I, should I chain myself to the table next time I have to read a book? Like, we need a protocol better than just we need to read and bear. Yeah. So, when we get off the boat, we'll talk about it. That's has has it. anyone noticed that 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 uh, Miles has locked himself? He only read for a, a few days, right? Because you have it takes a few days to read Dizan. Yep. yep. My Miles does seem to be keeping to himself. I mean, if I saw a traumatic event, I'd keep to myself. So I understand that need. Evelyn will join uh, Gary and. Or not Gary, uh, Alvin and Eugene the next day. Uh, she looks about as energetic as she did the day before, which is not very. Do you manage uh, but she'll at all? Kind of quietly keep company with them. I slept. Chris, until we pull into port, um, Alvin is going to watch over uh, Eugene and then otherwise. Um, he's still on his guard with everything that happened. So even after he thinks that Eugene is fine, he doesn't go back to uh, relaxation mode. He's uh, he's preeminently on guard until until we move uh, Gary to hospital. All right. Mm. Sorry, what was uh, Evelyn doing over the four days? Just basic stuff? Reading any of the books? Uh, no. No, she's not. Um, she's just sort of um, keeping company with uh, Eugene and Alvin. But other than that, being very subdued. Okay. This is definitely not New York Evelyn. So yeah, so finally uh, after since I since I love the sanity and was considered to have been I've had read the book of Eisen. Uh yes. I assume. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Oh, I still have reading to do, but it's more mundane reading. The thing I got on the, the rainbow snake from the library. Otherwise, we can move forward. Sorry. No worries. Um, so, yeah, after another four or five days of, you know, just kind of like meandering everybody, you know, keeping an eye on everybody else, you know, pretty much only seeing Miles at, at mealtime and probably maybe the occasional visit to Gary where you pass each other. Uh, you finally arrive in Darwin. It is the middle of September. Uh, Darwin, at this time, is a bustling city of roughly 1,100 people. Whoa. 1,100? Give or take. Good what Lord. kind of hospital is there here? A small one. <laughs> I think you're about it's to like say the best hospital that, in that. Australia. Yeesh. Uh, in the in 2021, it had a population of 139,000. Uh, it's a far cry from 1,100. <laughs> yes, <laughs> bustling city. Uh, it is a it is a lot of dirt roads. It is nicely laid out. Um, it is it is clean but very dusty. Uh, uh, but the uh, the doctor, uh, the doctor and the captain will make arrangements to have Gary uh, brought to the local hospital. They make sure that you guys have the address and everything so that you can visit. And you guys disembark in Darwin. We should try to find a place to stay. Should not be many here, considering the population. But I'm sure, we can find something. 
and we need to discuss how we're going to investigate that. I assume that's... I oh, sorry, I need to get back on the job. But more of your uh, wheelhouse, Alvin, how we're going to change that joint. Chris, yep. a thousand people. There's one hotel? Uh, there's actually uh, a couple of... Uh... Well, let's call them accommodations. Um, oh, also important to note, with its 1,100 or so people, Darwin is the largest city for over a 1,000 miles. Oh, dear God. It is Australia. Yep. Um, so it does, uh, it does have a very kind of racially diverse population, though, because it is, there is like a... Um, uh, there was like a gold rush uh, a couple of decades back, so that there's uh, an, a very un-Australian like racial diversity, including people from like Eastern Asia and things of that nature. Uh, but it is, uh, if you think of like a kind of like a like a Hollywood Western shanty town sort of vibe, you're not far off the mark. Wow. Uh, there are, uh, there is, uh, you know, people playing like a variety of card games in different taverns. There are a large number of ta taverns. Uh, there's two um, hotels called the Victoria Hotel and the Darwin Hotel. Uh, there's a bunch of pubs. Do they have vacancy? They do. Um, there are like, there, there's shops, there's like, you know, there, it's a port city. So they're like, there's sailors and like dock workers and things of that nature. Um, important note though, uh, ladies are not allowed in the bars. Uh, but, what? Uh, but several of the bars have ladies lounges. Are we allowed in the ladies lounges? Uh, I believe so, yes. <laughs> you don't want fraternizing. That could lead to, you know, stuff. Well, I guess we're lady for the duration of Darwin. <laughs> for context, Shawinigan is 50 times bigger than this place. Yes. I mean, I realized recently that Norway is exactly the same population as Montreal, so, you know. <laughs> Darwin had less people than Fredericton High School. Less people than Fredericton High School's graduating class some years. Well, if we were looking for everybody working for... <laughs> Shipping company in Frederick High School. I guess it would be easier. So that's that going for us. Chris, there is no ability for us to hide in a place like this, right? Like everyone Not really. knows everyone. Uh, more uh, everybody. Everybody kind of recognizes everyone, and everyone knows of everyone. So if you're like, "Hey, whatever happened to Johnny Smith?" They're like, "Oh, Johnny Smith. He went out that way. Got killed by a kangaroo." Okay, so there's less of a need to be surreptitious here. Um, let's get Gary into a hospital. Let's check into a hotel. And I need a prognosis on Gary. That's my number one things. Because if they say he's going to be up and running in a day or two, it is very different than it's going to take three months of recovery in terms of time and what we're going to do with it. Okay. And I, I am very clear with everyone that that's what I'm doing. My, my priority here, as much as the end of the world is happening, my friend who I have saved, who has saved my life and who I've saved their life, I need to know if he's going to be okay. Uh, so, yeah, so Gary's going to be in the hospital for probably between 10 days and two weeks. Until whenever Gary's player can get back. 
Fair. Moves the speed of plot. Okay. That said, I convene at the. How is the? I'm, I'm going to use the term furnishings, but I feel like I'm being overly generous of the hotel. Uh, it's. Uh, it's not so much that it's you know well furnished but the furniture that is here is sturdy um you're describing it like a russian mom like yeah. babushka yep uh it's it's rustic all right so we get some accommodations and then i laid out laid out on the team look two weeks what are we trying to do here and what can we do over two weeks then we'll figure out how we need to do it uh we needed to stop at darwin because the shipping company that was shipping the impossible artifact that you found in london is operating from here so okay. we might find the people that are working on the excavation we might find the company itself or who's behind it, because we still have a guy from the expedition that is missing and supposed to be in Australia. I don't have his name on top of my head, but he's might be running it, so he might be in this town. And if we trigger that, they can just walk over to Gary, who's in his bed, and stab him, right? So I feel like confronting them is a in two weeks kind of thing. What are the other things? That I we think we do? should go on I... gathering information discreetly part, not confronting them right they don't necessarily know that Gary is with us everyone knows everyone this little podunk thing they know he came in off the boat they know we went to go check on him yeah they probably would have noticed that that's true I'm not used to the small. We've been in hotels that help more people than this. It's creepy. So which hotel are we at again? Uh, probably the Darwin Hotel. Okay, so how do we ask around about what's going on in town and what's going on with the creepy shipping company without everyone knowing that we're asking around about the creepy shipping company. Well, I, we, have the address, we have the address, I think, so we could just go and observe that from a distance at, at a start. I think we have a shipping, uh, shipping slip for that place. Mm -hmm. Can we ship something as an excuse to go visit the place? I mean, we could pretend I'm... that we have some business, but we need to know better the business so we don't look like fools when we address them. Why don't we go to the ladies' lounge? Because I would very much like a drink. We can do that. We can move our conversation there. Any one mind? And we can ask around. We just came in off the boat. We're, we have a crate of things we've collected so far that we would like to ship back to New York. Or London, because we only do London. Right. Or and London. What shipping yeah, what shipping Anywhere. facilities are on. Mm -hmm. See what gossip we can pick up that way. That's great. Do we need a safe to put our books in while we're gone? I mean, I have a... Uh, how do you say that in English? A, ma a mal? Um, a chest. A travel chest? A travel... Mm -hmm. uh, usually trunk. I just lock everything in there. But... Steamer trunk. Steamer trunk, yeah. Usually I lock everything in there, but we, we can... Double lock it. <laughs> okay, we head to the uh, 
if they tell me that the books are secure enough, I believe them. And then we're going to head off to the ladies' lounge. And I am being observant. I, I'm assuming everyone's watching us, Chris, but is there anyone shady watching us? Uh, make spot hidden rolls. Ooh, triple stars. Um, Chris, I, I'm just assuming that just like um, Evelyn said, like, we're the new... Oh, rolls the seven. Very nice, Franklin. I mean, Mark. <laughs> Uh, I'm assuming we're the new kids in school, right? So everyone wants to take a look at us. Uh, there's, I mean, there's a fair number of people that get off the steamer with you. It's, it's not like you're the only newcomers to Darwin. You know, people have come here to, you know, try their hand at prospecting, uh, you know, see if they can find gold out in the, out in the desert. Um, so, yeah, so there's, I mean... The steamer ship came in and the population of Darwin went up by 10%. <laughs> That's terrible. Okay, yes, true. I didn't think this was the final destination of the steamer sh ship, and I don't think that we look like prospectors, but fair. fair. So we're keeping an eye out for what's going on. Yeah. Uh, uh, Alvin and Miles, there's, there's people, that are, people that are definitely keeping their eye on you, uh, but the two of you with your... Uh, the two of you getting extreme successes... Um, you you fairly quickly ascertain that they're they're judging whether or not they can like roll you in an alley and take whatever you've got, sort of thing. Like run of the mill near do wells, as opposed to cultists. Fair. Uh, but you guys can easily find a, a pub host with a ladies' lounge, and we join our lady for a drink. Scandalous. Thank you. Mm, isn't it though? Uh, specifically, you guys find one called Bertram's Bar. <laughs> Bertram or Bertrand? Uh, Bertram. B E R T R A M. Okay. Uh, and you guys would notice that the signs outside say that the. Uh, and you'll notice this at like the various pubs that you pass. Uh, pub hours are 9 a.m. till 6 p.m. What? Um, we are in Ontario again. I don't know if I'm more if Alvin is more upset about the opening times or or the fact that they're segregating women and men. Yes. <laughs> You're angry they're closed at six p.m. Uh, fun historical. So fun historical fact. Um, Australia at this time had this thing called the six o'clock six o'clock swell because. <laughs> Because most people worked until five, and the bars closed at six. So it was happy hour. Uh, no, it wasn't. It was how much booze can we drink in that hour? Good God! I wonder what the reaction after the hours was. So, like, you know, is that the and, law that make it close at six? Yeah. Alvin what does one of those hilarious it? double takes where he looks at the opening hours for the ladies' lounge and then walks over to the real bar and looks at the opening hours there because he's like, maybe they need to go to bed early. Like, I don't understand. <laughs> maybe they need to go to bed early. Uh, he just doesn't get it. Yes, we can't let the women folk go walking around after sunset. Yep. Or, you know, after supper. Maybe it's a kangaroo dumb. thing. I don't. He, he just didn't get it. I mean, on the plus side, the bars do open at nine o'clock in the morning. <sighs> How long do we have to drink here, Chris? <laughs> uh, by the, what what time is it? It's about ten thirty in the morning. In the morning. Okay. Well, we have all day to drink. Okay. Because <laughs> that sounds like a good idea. Well, I, he was specific all day, not all night, right? So that's true. That's true. We don't have all night. We don't have any night. We barely have a touch of the evening. Apparently, they didn't extend bar hours until ten to ten p.m. on a state by state basis. 
until like Tasmania started in 1937. Some didn't get it until like the late 50s or the late 60s. <laughs> what? Yep. Okay. I'm still trying to find the rationale for it. Uh, apparently it used to be really liberal and then uh, a bunch of drunken uh, sailors or soldiers cause a bunch of trouble. No. <laughs> yeah. So that would 50%, never happen. <laughs> 50% of today is trying to plan our investigation and 50% is trying to understand why things close at six. <laughs> yeah. Apparently it was, like introduced during World War I. it was introduced during World War One as part of a war austerity measure. Oh, there you go. Prior to that, they closed at 11 or 11.30 p.m. Hmm. Right. Uh, but yes, uh, Bertrand's Bar does have a ladies' lounge. Uh, there's a few people in here already uh, deep into their beer. At uh, 10.30 in the morning. Okay. Yep. yep. Well, I can't say I blame them, really. Many of the people here look like they are at the uh, the people who came here looking to strike it rich, and they're on the downside of that particular hill. Well, I don't think we're going to get much accomplished until at least noon. Judging by the clientele. But by all I'm means, gentlemen. Maybe you'll have Donald, a look. Donald, people might have gossip because they have nothing better to do. <laughs> I'm going to find a comfortable seat. Yeah, we get ourselves a booth and we start asking. We tr Okay, so we're going to figure out why things close at 6 and what we're going to do about this wonderful little area or the shipping company. So um, we're probably not doing a lot of research today. We're just figuring out that, hey, maybe we can ship something. So maybe we need to buy something that we need to ship in a crate to London for some reason. And uh, that's per I think that's pretty much what we're going to do today. We're going to do a lot of things in slow motion as we wait for Gary. But um, OK. Get acquainted with locals and stuff like that. Yeah. So we can exactly. just by asking question and don't look that strange. Exactly. Perfect. Play the long game of weaving your story in. All right. Uh, why don't folks give me uh, your choice of fast talk, charm, uh, listen, or persuade? Not the skill I want to improve, but definitely want to have the best odds. Yeah, I can't use psychology. Holy shit, Miles. I'll be using listen. You rolled a seven before and now you rolled a six? Oh, we're doomed tomorrow night. <laughs> and you rolled a two? <laughs> we are so fucked tomorrow night. <laughs> oh. We are apparently very eager to listen to and talk to people outside of our little group of four. I mean, a hard yeah, we're listen we're, and I'm we're listening I'm closely in. because the Australian accents are so thick it's messing up. <laughs> maybe that's fair. Maybe that's it. I'm I'm speaking with people. I'm. <laughs> it, it was either one of those four skills, though. I chose first word. <laughs> Um, all right, so uh, so Miles, uh, as you're kind of like listening into various conversations here and there, um, you uh, you overhear uh, this uh, you know definitely in his cups gentleman uh, talking to one of the one of the ladies. Seems like he's trying to impress her with like you know the the money he's made as like a um, basically a, a camel drover. Uh, and when it appears she's not interested, his, his story started getting kind of like more, um, more embellished uh, until he's telling her uh, about this uh, uh, a time when he was in the Great Sandy Deserts and he came across this uh, this nasty 
a tribe of uh, of native people who are worshiping some sort of uh, bat god. Uh, and when he was running for uh, out of out of fear for his life from them, he tripped and fell down a like a sand dune, and stumbled across like hundreds of bodies uh, that must have been attacked by bats. They had like tiny little puncture wounds and they were horribly diseased. Um, you know, he's so inebriated that he can't tell that he's like repelling this woman with the, the tales of his, you know, cowardice and running away. And then the, you know, diseased and bloated bodies that he stumbled into. Uh, he seems to think it makes him sound very impressive. Uh, but she very quickly makes a, uh, an excuse to to leave um but and then he like you know realizing that he's been left kind of like just turns to his drink you know kind of muttering under his breath about how you know that's the last time that he's gone out in the desert that sort of thing now that there's a space i'm gonna sidle up next to him and i'm gonna order us a couple of drinks he, uh, he kind of perks right up at that. Like, ah, oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, I would order some more myself, but, uh, you know, times are a little bit tough. Tough. Oh, no, that's quite all right, good Matt. I couldn't help hearing the story, and while um, it failed to impress that lovely lady, I found it very interesting. I, for one, would love to hear more about it, if you'd be willing to tell us over this, over a drink. Um, oh, and he's, he starts going on and starts like really kind of embellishing, uh, about, you know, stumbling across this, uh, this fierce tribe. And it seems like as, as he starts to talk, I want to just note where my compatriots are to possibly either lure him to a table to continue the conversation there or give a, give a sort of a look of join us, like a nod toward motion to the bar. Uh, gotcha. And yeah, you can, uh, looking at everybody's roles here, you can kind of easily grab their attention. Um, and yeah, this, uh, this gentleman, like once he seems like he's got a captive audience and, you know, is being plied with drinks as he talks, um, he keeps suddenly remembering other details. You know, the, the story kind of like starts to, to, to fade out. And then you order a, another round. He's like, oh, wait, I remember. And he, he pulls that like as often as he can. Like every time his glass is empty, he starts like, oh, I think that's uh, everything that. Uh... And then is the, when the like fresh glass is like, oh, wait, there is one more thing. I try to distinguish between uh, the part that he, well, the foundation, the part that are actually true the part that he, he's just filling time with. Yeah. Um, and as he, you know, as he's getting drunker and louder um, and telling this tale, some other people from around kind of pipe in with like corrections or, yeah, I heard that sort of thing as well or that sort of thing. Um, so it seems like it's it's a fairly common tall tale in these parts. Um Everybody seems to have like their own like little spin on it. Um, but there's there's no doubt at all in your mind. It's like as he's talking and as he's remembering, he starts to get that kind of crazed look in his eye. Um, and either either he did encounter this or he firmly believes he encountered this. Um but it starts off with like the tale that he uh, that he told the uh, the woman about you know finding this like this you know nasty evil cannibalistic bat god worshiping group of uh, of aboriginals out in the desert, um, you know they 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 killed his men they like butchered his camels he fled with his for his life, um, t stumbled across uh, like a mass grave with like hundreds of these bodies. Uh, horribly diseased uh obviously attacked by swarms of bats their bodies covered in these tiny puncture wounds uh somebody else in the the, the crowd kind of speaks up and says like i wonder if that's the same one that uh, 
that uh, that caravaner that was here about a month ago said he saw said he saw the bat god himself. Worst thing he'd ever seen in his life. And because like, oh, I heard that story too. Like nasty bat, bigger than bigger than two horses, uh, able to pick a man up, uh, leave no trail behind. And the story starts to kind of spread and spread. Um, I'm just kind of like looking at people's roles here. Um, Alvin and Eugene, since you guys were kind of doing like persuasion-y, fast talky type things, you start to kind of lay into it a little bit. Um, and one of them has heard that this uh, this bat cult is uh, it's not Aboriginal at all. It's something done by the by the white people, by the colonists. Um, like an, an old wives' tale to to you know to keep everybody indoors at night when the real uh, you know when the real riches are to be found, sort of thing. Um, and the last thing, Evelyn, you over here, um, kind of as like little side conversations are happening. Um, people talk about very quietly, like I wonder if this is related to uh, to uh, the the city in the desert. Uh, the, the city with the old man who will one day rise and devour the world. Uh, so that's I'm basically... sorry. I'm sorry. What? That that gets a fast talk from me. Like, <laughs> I want them to spill way more about that. Than... Yeah, Evelyn will kind of perk up at the who's doing what now? Uh, so yeah, so that is the that is the gist of the conversation that you guys pick up like over several hours of buying drinks and everything. But if there's anything in particular that you want to find out more information about or interact with, you're certainly free to do so. But that's the broad picture of what you what you get. Oh, I think we definitely want to know more about this man who's supposed to rise up. Evelyn does at least. Yeah, the ancient city with the guy rising up and ending the world. That sounds. On point. Familiar? <laughs> yep. Just a little. Um, so, yeah, so you kind of like go up to the, the two guys. Oh. Oh, I mean, anybody who's been around here for a while has heard stories and. Uh, story. Uh, who was it that told us? Like I said, was it Johnny? I think it was Johnny. Yeah, it was Johnny. Uh, Johnny Big Bush uh, works uh, works up at Randolph Shipping. Uh, told us this uh, this story um, uh, from his tribe about how there's this wonderful city hidden in the desert, uh, and this uh, enormous giant man who sleeps with his head in his arms named Budai. Uh, who snores underneath the city and then one day he will rise and devour the world i mean i don't know much beyond that i mean johnny you know johnny didn't really go into details we kind of said like no that's a that's not even really a good story johnny um thanks thanks for coming out so we didn't but i mean listen to these folks talk about you know like weird cults and you know people being killed by bats by the hundreds and you know we're just talking about all the weird stories that we've heard i'm gonna ask evelyn, evelyn like are you keeping track of all these crazy things like trying evelyn is going to play socialite and uh play up the fact that this is much more interesting than uh, tea time in Massachusetts. I'm going to try to support her with my social acumen. So to help, I, I, I let her lead, but I try to be supportive of that. All right. Uh, Evelyn can give me a charm roll. Oh, Evelyn is not charming. Evelyn is psychology focused, not charm. <laughs> uh, you you do get a, a bonus die from uh, Eugene helping. Oh, well, that's a relief because my 15 isn't going to get me far. Although. And yeah. <laughs> We're so fucked tomorrow night. <laughs> 
I, I'm definitely uh, saying that that success was not my dice roll. That that was undoubtedly Eugene helping. No. <laughs> <laughs> my dice aren't that kind. Not twice in a night. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what is Evelyn asking them? Uh, Evelyn wants as much information about this Budai person as they can tell her. Because she's never heard that name before. Um, and... She's not the guy who told the story. Maybe we can find the prior sources. Right. Uh, you can make an occult roll. I mean, they'll tell you what they know, uh, but basically what they know is the story that Johnny told them. It's like a third, fourth hand story. Alright. Uh, if you had to guess, Evelyn, um, it's probably it's probably one of the Aboriginal tribes' myths and legends. The big problem is, is that at this point in time, there are probably around 900 different Aboriginal tribes in Australia. Um, so... It's possible it might be like the local name for, I mean, most religions, most mythologies have like a creation story and an end of the world story. Mm -hmm. uh, so this would, this is obviously an end of the world story, but the particulars, <laughs> the particulars would change from tribe to tribe to tribe to tribe. And it depends on which particular tribe this Johnny fellow comes from would provide like his own particular slant on the story. So what you're saying is that if we were to go see any tribe that can give us details, the generalities of what they can give us is going to be, we hope, correct. But the details are going to be different from tribe to tribe? Uh, yeah, kind of like how, you know, like all kinds of different real world histories have a story about a great flood, but the details change. Yeah. Um, so while you're talking to those guys, uh, Miles, uh, the guy that you're, uh, you're kind of playing with drinks, uh, by the time he gets, you know, like his, you know, fifth or sixth beer into him, uh, and he realizes that, you know, he's kind of, he kind of started the crowd, but he's also kind of lost the crowd. And now you're the only one that's still there. He's like, kind of leans over very kind of, but like that kind of like, drunk conspiratorial type of lean in where you can f like just smell the beer like on his breath i'm just like hey 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 i want to see something it depends on what it is it's like and he kind of like <laughs> he he very obviously very obviously discreetly uh kind of looks around And then he uh, kind of like reaches down. He pulls up uh, like an old military like canvas uh, duffel bag sort of thing. It's like I haven't shown many people this, but when I was that time, I found uh, I found this, and he kind of like zips it open. Um, and then he kind of like looks around and like shh, because it made a zipping sound. Uh, he's obviously very inebriated at this point. Um, and he kind of like opens it up to show you and inside is what looks like, um, uh, it looks like some sort of club, uh, but it's made of, it doesn't look like it's made out of wood and embedded along it are hundreds of what look like little pebbles. Uh, but Niles can give me a uh, natural world roll. Oof. Um, I don't have enough luck. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's definitely not made out of wood. Um, it looks like it's... Uh, it's definitely a natural material that's been like uh, like shellacked almost, but it's definitely not wood. 
Uh, and those things that at first glance are pebbles, as you kind of look carefully at them, he's not taking it out of the bag. But as you look carefully at them, uh, their teeth. Uh, far too small to be human teeth. And far too pointy. Are you implying they're like goblin teeth? No, he's implying they're bat teeth. Yes. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's not better. <laughs> you make that yourself? No, no. I found it. Found it in the desert. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, when I get the, the money together to get back to Sydney, maybe go to the uh, go to the school there. See uh, see if they'll buy it. Make it off for miles. I don't know how this seems actually worth anything, but <laughs> uh, how much were you looking to get for it? Oh, uh, oh, her kind of looks at miles. Takes a second to kind of focus. Uh, well, if I can get to city, uh, if I can get some money, then I can get a boat and I can get back home. Uh, so I was hoping they'd give me uh, like 150 pounds. 150 pounds. How about a discount for your good friend Miles, who's been... Treating you to the finest alcohol that Darwin has to offer. Um, give me a persuasion roll with a bonus die. This isn't going to go. You can ask for help. Well, I'll roll my bonus die and see how it goes. Is this worth spending four luck on? I'm down to 15. Um, no, you're probably, you're probably okay. Like 100 and 150 pounds. It's, it's pretty steep, but yeah, especially in this era. Um, but yeah, but compared to, compared to like the money that you have from, from Jackson, uh, it's not much at all. Okay. How how are we how are we handling this? Does, do we have a checkbook basically? Uh, I'm assuming that you guys have like some spending cash, and then when periodically you like wire back to the lawyer to to get it like topped up. So do we have somebody who's carrying the purse right now? Uh, I mean, if, if not, I'll just pull out 150 pounds. Yeah. Sure, I'll carry the purse in my purse. All right. I was going to suggest Alvin since he's the most stable. <laughs> Dude didn't speak up. I was going to say, that sounds relative. It is I relative. Did assume it was Al I did assume it was Alvin, but it, it, I, not based on anything, just my gut. Uh, but yes, so apparently Evelyn is the uh, keeper of the purse strings. At least for today. We'll see how that changes. So I'll quietly go to them and saying this gentleman has something that might be worth purchasing. Maybe, I don't know, but it seems to be related to what we are investigating. Oh, well, that's interesting. It means he's got some experience. Well, he has tails, and his tails seem to have a little bit more truth behind them than the rest of the tall tale that I'm hearing. So what does he have that you want to buy? A club that looks like it's made of a material I'm not certain of that is adorned with bat teeth. Oh. Well, that's definitely familiar, then. How much do you need? 
He wants 150 pounds so that he can get back home to Sydney or somewhere, or get to Sydney so he can go home from Sydney. She'll give him 200. Oh, sweet. So I'll go over. I'm going to buy a bottle. I'm going to buy a bottle of what we've been drinking, give him the bottle, and then give him the rest of the money. With... All right. So, oh. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'll be able to, uh, I'll be able to get back home to, to England with this. That's excellent. Oh, you're from England. So I was originally from England. Oh, well, it'll be nice to, nice to see it again. I've been, uh, I've been away too long. Well, it's been a pleasure doing business and sharing tales over drinks with you this evening. So. And he'll uh, he'll tip his glass to that, and he will hand over the uh, the club to you. He doesn't. He keeps his bag, but he gives you the club. I was about to ask him if he'd be willing to part with the bag, <laughs> so we're not walking around just with this big club. Actually, that might be good for a deterrent for those people who want to roll with. Okay. Uh, but yes, yeah, so he hands over this. It's uh, Once it's like out of the bag, you get a better look at it. The, the reason you didn't immediately identify it, it looks like it's um, basically like different... Different types of wood or different colors of wood that are kind of like lacquered together. Like a fair amount of craftsmanship went into this thing, uh, and the uh, the the head of it, for lack of a better term, is studded with uh, these uh, like tiny, tiny teeth. It is very well made, very well balanced, very well weighted. Is there anything else on it, like initials, some kind of identifier, anything else that looks relevant? Uh, there is, uh, kind of like burned into it, uh, is. I'll uh, post a picture to Discord. When you when you bring that to the group, I'll have a question. So yeah, kind of like a like a sigil is kind of like carved into it. Huh. It does look like a bat. It does. Kinda. Um, but uh, it, are you taking the, the back over to everybody else there, Miles? Or yep, perfect. All right. Uh, so everybody else um, can give me either natural world or anthropology rules. And I was uh, I wanted to check on it if. Uh, medicine wise because I know they were transmitting um, disease like if that thing was made to inject anything or if it was like filthy with something that could transmit disease or anything like that um, it doesn't doesn't appear to be like there's no reservoir or anything on it okay just fearful a bit of that part <laughs> Uh, I mean, it is, uh, the, the teeth on it are fairly sharp and you're pretty sure like if you, if you like basically dragged it through a bunch of dirt or a bunch of shit or something, then it would quite easily infect wounds. Okay. Um, but yes, uh, and Evelyn, you could roll natural world or anthropology as well. Yeah, they're both the same level of terrible. Okay. All right. Uh, Eugene, that is... Uh, 
it looks like it's it looks like it's somebody trying to mimic uh like traditional uh aboriginal weapons um like it's you're you're pretty sure like if if this was to be sold to uh to a museum uh it's not it's not authentic but it's trying very hard to be it seems to be made out of uh out of different layers of eucalyptus uh which is an incredibly dense wood uh but but there's like it's not it's not manufactured by hand like this was this was machined oh well you know it's clearly way this is disappointing, but for our own research, this is enlightening. I remember the, the part that we exported from here where it felt like a machine part. But this thing has not been made by hand. This thing has been made by a machine. It is too perfect. It has been... Like, they are making this. It was not made in the bush. I don't think it was made in the intention of trying to sell it to a museum. I think it was made to be as efficient as possible while still chattering to ancient things. We're dealing with a different kind of beast here. I'm thinking, though, it's probably, well, no, it's undoubtedly the same group. This was made for efficiency. Terrible efficiency. Mm-hmm. Most of the things they make seem to be. So, do we want to wait for a bit for things to die down and then start asking about shipping? Or do we want to come back here tomorrow and start drinking again at nine in the morning? Well, the guy you spoke, you got the story, they got the story from work at the shipping company we're looking at. So that's a lead. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's very good. So, yeah. Those people know us now. They know we're from the boat. We can let the information flow that we're God. We want to go and, and get some of our finding from the desert ship to London, to the London Museum, so it's art and not gold, so we don't get anybody on the earth. <laughs> <laughs> wanting to get us and see if we can get a bit more of that but I think I would uh, push that on to one more day so it doesn't seem too forced so you think we should go back to the hotel for today and start drinking again tomorrow <laughs> we can't have I'm... tea or coffee too we, we, we can have <laughs> I am all in favor of just coming back and starting to drink again tomorrow. Okay. Hey, Chris, question. Bars close at six, but what about restaurants? Do restaurants stay open but aren't allowed to serve? Uh, yes. 
Is it like a bring your own wine situation where you can bring alcohol? No, it is not. <laughs> That's not to say that there's not like, you know, speakeasies and, and similar, but uh, any legal sale of alcohol stops at six. Darwin doesn't seem like a big enough town to have a speakeasy that could stay hidden. It's a prospector town. There's probably like one in every second house. It's the speaking of being a ten somewhere, like just there, and then the one there. <laughs> it's Jim's uh, restroom, you know, like. Yeah, I mean, out out here, out in Frederickton Junction, which has a population of like maybe two hundred people, there's like at least four bootleggers. Yes, but bootlegging no. is available like through the internet, like how to do it. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, where there's a where there's a bunch of people who are like trying to drink away their troubles because they haven't struck it rich when they thought they would. Six o'clock is not much of a deterrent. I mean, we're before tomorrow six, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. uh, but yes, uh, as you guys kind of like look around and realize that. Well, Darwin is definitely uh, an interesting locale. Uh, we will uh, bring it to a close there. You guys can decide what you'd like to do. Uh, you know Gary's going to be a couple of days before he's on the mend. Uh, but we'll uh, pick that up next week. Um, I assume Gary's probably going to be able to join us next week, so... Uh, yeah, we can montage a bit at the beginning of the game next time. Yeah, it, it's easy like... enough to kind of montage, just kind of like asking around, trying to get some information uh, before deciding to go and visit the shipping company. Okay. Good. Uh, but right. I will, uh, I will click yeah. it on to development, and people can make their uh, luck improvement rolls. Give me some luck, baby. Got seven, Eugene. I was at twenty-five. Well, I I know that Miles went at fifteen, but twenty-five. You is and fine. I, you and I both got seven. We're doomed tomorrow night. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Don't yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so good roll tonight. <laughs> what, uh... <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, so we'll see, uh, we'll see everybody next week for Call of Cthulhu, except, uh, Mark won't be here next week. He's got a, a, a prior thing. Yeah. Um, and we'll see, uh, we'll see many of you tomorrow for Forbidden Lands. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Hopefully you will have some semblance of good lo- lo- good rolls tomorrow night. Hopefully. Hopefully you didn't use them all up tonight. Uh, what, did you have enough uh, enough stuff for tomorrow from what we discussed on the Discord? Yeah, I'm I'm good. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. Uh, beer bandits too. The beerening. Oh God! Oh, no. Beer bandits too. Oh <laughs> no! No beer the, bandits. Oh. The so beer bad. bandits and a certain squirrel was riding shotgun with it. <sighs> yeah. Squirrel. For the for those of you that don't uh, don't watch our Forbidden Land stream, uh, the party. Uh, we've been playing for 70-some sessions now. The party is has a fair bit of XP under the belt. They have dealt with Death Knights. No problem. They've dealt with, like, Haunted Castles. No problem. Bunch orc of captains. Orc captains. No problem. The Orc Captain is my pride and joy. Like, like <laughs> four, or, four or five heavily inebriated bandits that had stolen beer from a halfling almost TPK'd them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was so bad. So bad. I would say the dragon was even on par with the beer bandits, if not slightly less. <laughs> the, that dragon was easier than the beer bandits. Yeah. yeah. I. It's it's a thing. Um, skeleton, skeletons and uh, swarms of dead and is also with the oh, hands. Oh God, the hands. So yes, yep. um, so yeah, we'll see. Uh, we'll see some of you folks tomorrow for Forbidden Lands, and uh, I, I cannot promise there won't be bear bandits. And who knows? Maybe next well, week in Call of Cthulhu, there'll be like the bear bandits' long lost cousins. Oh dear God! Yeah, no. Breaking bear bandits. 
Perfect. All Riding right. Hypothalamus. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So we'll see everybody uh, next week for more Call of Cthulhu. Night, guys. Night, night. night everybody. <laughs> Good night, everyone.